Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are. Thank you very much for joining us on uh, Saturday. Uh, this is uh, one of our series of webinars that we are holding uh, between University of Birmingham's WHO Collaborative Center for Global Women's Health, as well as LE Charity. Uh, the topic for today is vaccination for COVID-19 in pregnant women, as well as for healthcare professionals who are caring for them. We have a stellar group of uh, clinicians and researchers with expertise who are joining us today. They're also joined by trustees of LE Charity. I shall introduce uh, the members uh, just before their talk. Uh, so about myself, uh, I'm Shakila Tangaratinam. I'm Professor of Maternal and Perinatal Health at University of Birmingham. And I'm supported today by Nawai Moss from LA Charity and Caroline Gillett, our Public Engagement Manager from University of Birmingham. So before we move into vaccines and pregnancy, uh, I'd like to give a brief overview on why we are here on what is the effect of COVID-19 in pregnancy, um, uh, the burden, how it presents. So we have been um, doing evidence synthesis, what we call a living systematic review on um, the clinical manifestations, risk factors, and outcomes of COVID-19 in pregnancy. The, the first one was published in BMJ last year, and the first update has now been published this month. Uh, in fact, it's, it is heart of the press. Uh, we currently have, uh, up to September 2020, 192 studies on pregnant women with COVID, and the numbers keep increasing, just highlighting um, the interest as well as the need for research in this area. Uh, to date, we have information on 64,000 pregnant and recently pregnant women with COVID. And uh, unfortunately, 339 pregnant women uh, with confirmed COVID died from any reason based on data from uh, 60 studies. Uh, we continue to do this work. So we have a team that's constantly searching, assessing evidence, extracting data. So we will update you on a regular basis um, in the coming uh, months. Our hope is that the numbers do slow down as the pandemic settles. So what does our latest update show? The prevalence of COVID-19 in pregnancy is very similar to what you're observing in the general population. This is over a period of time. It still remains stable at 10%. And in those studies where all pregnant women were tested, we can expect 7% of pregnant women to have um, to be positive for COVID. Um, uh, we also see that pregnant women seem to manifest symptoms uh, less frequently than those who are uh, non-pregnant across all, all symptoms. And this is uh, the data that is now getting uh, more robust and much more clearer compared to our, um, the first publication. Uh, with the increased numbers, we now have over 34,000 women with COVID compared to half a million with non-COVID women of reproductive age. Um, so these are young non-pregnant women we are talking about. Uh, it appears that pregnant women are at high risk of being admitted to the intensive care unit, uh, needing invasive ventilation, uh, as well as um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation as a treatment um, for COVID. And with regards to pregnancy outcomes, they seem to be at slightly increased risk of preterm birth. And it is possible a lot of this is because of iatrogenic uh, prematurity because they end up being delivered for uh, either worsening COVID or any associated conditions. Uh, stillbirths and neonatal deaths are continue to be extremely rare. Uh, based on current evidence, uh, it does not seem to be there's a large risk of mother to child transmission, therefore vaginal delivery and breastfeeding are safe in pregnant women with COVID. And again, this is another um, information uh, that's getting a bit more clearer on what are the characteristics that predispose pregnant women with COVID to have a severe COVID. Um, so similar to the general population, women who are older, who have a high body mass index or
testing, intensive care unit admissions, um, needing invasive ventilations, all of the risk factors. There is emerging evidence that it is possible that conditions that are specific to pregnancy, like gestational diabetes and preeclampsia may be associated, but the numbers are still small and we are continuing to keep an eye on that information. So that's a brief summary. So where we stand, uh, the prevalence is 10%. Pregnant women seem to be at increased risk of severe COVID compared to non-pregnant women. Uh, amongst pregnancy outcomes, preterm birth rates seem to be high. And there are certain characteristics in pregnant women that when they have COVID, it predisposes them to severe COVID. And the reason why we started this webinar is we need to understand the risks and mothers need to be informed of the risks that predispose when it comes to treatment as well as in the take up of the vaccine. And these are the links and I shall put them on the chat uh, for you to access them if you need any further information. And there is a, a animation, some of the uh, shorts I've shown you today that you can access on COVID in pregnancy. Thank you. So that's my uh, brief overview. And, and, and to start off, uh, I would like, it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Paul Heap, who is a professor of pediatric infectious diseases at St. George's University of London and the director of the Vaccine Institute to join our panel. He's also the chief investigator of the UK Novavax vaccine trial. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions uh, to ask him about vaccines in pregnancy. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and it's a great pleasure to be here. I trust you can hear me and see my slides. So thank you for asking me to speak. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines and uh, indeed um, uh, doing so in 10 minutes is, is a challenge, um, uh, but we uh, can, I think, have a, a brief overview and then perhaps in the discussion, there may be more specific questions. So what I would hope to do is to provide a brief overview of SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and COVID-19, the disease, although Shakila has just done that, particularly in the context of pregnant women. Uh, the development of vaccines, the current status of vaccine trials, the, uh, what we know of the efficacy of vaccines, and then uh, we'll move on to vaccination in pregnant and or breastfeeding women. So I, I don't think I need to tell this audience that in December 2019, a novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, emerged. And of course, in contrast to the outbreaks with previous coronaviruses, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, this particular virus has exhibited an unprecedented scale of infection, such that a global pandemic was declared uh, just over a year ago on the 11th of March, 2020. And of course, we all know how devastating this pandemic has been in terms of numbers of cases and numbers of deaths. It was clear at a very early stage that the rapid development, distribution, and administration of vaccine to the global population would be the most effective approach to suppressing this pandemic. But of course, therein lie many challenges, challenges in terms of vaccine design, manufacture, and the global distribution. Uh, so this is the virus. It's a, an RNA virus, uh, a number of important structural and non-structural proteins. Uh, and they're shown in this cartoon here. But the, the one to focus on is the pink one, the pink cone-shaped structure, which is, of course, the spike protein. Uh, and, and this is important for a number of reasons, important in the pathogenesis of disease itself um, uh, and important in terms of immunity, because we now know that immunity to the spike protein is critical uh, in terms of protecting against disease. And for that reason, most of the vaccine candidates uh, have targeted the spike protein. The, the rapid development of vaccines over the last 12 months has been hugely impressive and was made possible for a number of reasons. They, they include the fact that the genomic and structural information uh, uh, about this virus were made available in record time 
And also there was prior knowledge of vaccines against coronaviruses because candidate vaccines against the SARS and the MERS vaccines had been developed. But of course, none of them had been licensed. And we did not know and still do not know the immunological correlates of protection against any coronavirus. Uh, but nevertheless, the first vaccine to be uh, given to humans was the Moderna, the RNA vaccine from Moderna vaccine. And that was an astonishing 63 days from identify, identification of the sequence to phase one human clinical testing. The, the vaccine platforms that have been uh, included now uh, in the candidates, the COVID-19 candidates are many. And these include the more traditional vaccine candidates like protein adjuvant vaccines, inactivated and even live attenuated vaccines, but also include uh, novel technologies, the nucleic acid and viral vectored uh, vaccine technologies. And these are novel and we have not up until this time had any licensed vaccines uh, using these technologies. That's a particular feature of the COVID-19 vaccine programs. And this slide here summarizes the uh, current status of the COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, I would recommend this, this uh, site to you, the London School uh, website on COVID-19 vaccines, if you would like to, to learn more, because it is all very well covered in here. Um, so you can see here that there are more than 300 vaccine candidates, of which 81 are currently in clinical testing. You can also see uh, down the um, left-hand side here, the types of vaccines that have been employed. Uh, the most common uh, type, in fact, is the protein subunit vaccine, perhaps a slightly more traditional approach to vaccine development. Uh, but here we also have the RNA vaccines, we have the uh, viral vectored vaccines, uh, and then a number of others, including DNA vaccine. You can see along the bottom at what stage of clinical testing they are. Um, and some, of course, have come through phase three and are even now into phase four, which is post-implementation testing. A and uh, even more of the vaccines are in routine use in a number of different countries. So this, this rapid development over the space of nine months is, is astonishing. So on this slide, I have summarized for you the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines from phase three trials, uh, uh, more or less to this time. Now, the top four uh, are from published uh, papers, so peer-reviewed publications. The, the, the bottom four are from um, press releases uh, from the respective companies, so we just need to bear that in mind. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see in the big red um, numbers here, very high efficacy. And of course, the first one to, to, to come out, uh, although it was the second one into clinical trials, was the Pfizer vaccine, the RNA vaccine from Pfizer uh, and BioNTech. Uh, ex extremely high efficacy, 95%. All of these efficacies are against PCR-proven COVID-19. Um, there are different definitions, alas, that are used in terms of mild, moderate, and severe. But nonetheless, these are all very high figures across the board. The other thing to point out is this column here, which is perhaps less apparent, which is severe COVID. And one of the other things that we've learned is that all of these vaccines are even more effective against severe COVID. So that's hospitalization, intensive care admission and death. So the vaccines are performing uh, really well against these severe endpoints. Uh, and then the other thing to say is that where uh, the, uh, the, the phase three trials have also looked at uh, other groups, particularly the elderly and those with other comorbidities, they have also performed extremely well with high efficacy. Okay, clearly there are differences between these vaccines. This is a summary of the leading vaccines. They're different in different types, as I've said. Most of them are two dose vaccines with one exception, which is the Janssen vaccine, which is a one dose schedule. Of course, the other important difference between them is in terms of storage, transport and storage. Uh, and uh, as you know, the RNA vaccines in particular are more challenging in that respect. Uh, and that has implications for their rollout. OK, this is a, a really nice slide, I think, because it just demonstrates how quickly um, these vaccines have been developed and now implemented. 
And of course, post-implementation, we're now starting to learn about vaccine effectiveness. How, how effective are they in the population when they're rolled out? And uh, you can see from predominantly UK data, although the top one is from Israel, that they're all performing extremely well. So the vaccine effectiveness in the field uh, for either the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca, which are the, the, the only ones really that have been employed in large numbers in population so far, are extremely high. And this is incredibly reassuring. Okay, so when it comes to thinking about pregnancy and um, COVID-19 vaccines, we have to recognize, first of all, that the majority of the COVID-19 va vaccine platforms that have been employed for COVID-19 vaccine development have never been assessed before in pregnant women. We also have to recognize that all of the phase three trials that I've alluded to have excluded pregnant and breastfeeding women. So we start from a position of having very, a very small evidence uh, base so we need, uh, I think, therefore, to go back to general principles in terms of vaccinating pregnant or breastfeeding women. So those general principles include the fact that there is no evidence of risk with inactivated virus, bacterial vaccines, or toxoids when given to pregnant women. In fact, we know that inactivated vaccines, of course, do not rep replicate and so cannot damage the fetus. And uh, several of them are actively recommended in pregnancy, of course, influenza, um, uh, is, is, is routinely recommended to protect pregnant women. And others are recommended, of course, uh, if there is a significant risk. So meningococcal vaccines, another um, uh, subunit uh, protein-based vaccine, uh, polysaccharide protein-based vaccine, are recommended in certain circumstances. And of course, tetanus vaccine, uh, huge experience with tetanus vaccine in pregnancy, and now a very large experience with pertussis-containing vaccines in pregnancy. Live vaccines are generally contraindicated in pregnancy, and this is because of the theoretical risk of fetal infection. But it should also be pointed out that there is no evidence to date of direct fetal injury as a result of live vaccines being given inadvertently in pregnancy. And that sort of uh, evidence uh, went into the use of or recommendation for the use uh, of the live attenuated Ebola vaccine in pregnant women uh, in the context, of course, of a, 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 uh, an Ebola uh, outbreak, just demonstrating that these rules are relative rules, not absolute rules. And in certain circumstances where the risks to the woman and the unborn child are sufficiently high, a case can be made for even using live vaccines in pregnancy. And when it comes to um, adenovirus uh, vectored vaccines, which of course is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and also the Janssen vaccine, and also the, uh, the Russian Sputnik V uh, vaccine. These are all adenovirus vaccines, and these are live adenovirus vectors, but they cannot replicate. Therefore, they cannot cause infection in the mother or the fetus. And in fact, adenovirus vectored Ebola vaccines have also been used in that context. Um, as I mentioned, uh, none of the uh, phase three vaccine trials have uh, included pregnant women. So where else do we look for evidence with regard to pregnancy and these COVID-19 vaccines? Well, we know that uh, for all of the, the leading vaccines, reproductive tox toxicity studies have been done in animal models. And uh, these have either been published or as yet unpublished, but none of them have shown any uh, evidence of direct or indirect harmful effects with respect to pregnancy, embryo, fetal development, uh, uh, parturition, or postnatal development. In the phase three trials, there were, in fact, a number of women who were pregnant who were inadvertently vaccinated. And to this time, there are no known concerns associated with that. Now, there are currently planned pregnancy studies in pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh, so Pfizer, uh, AstraZeneca and Janssen uh, are all uh, doing these uh, studies. The Pfizer study is the first to have started. So we will know, um, we will have very specific evidence on the use of these vaccines in pregnant women before too long. And of course, the other thing is that since the vaccines have been implemented in different populations, a number of pregnant women have decided to be vaccinated. And it's hard to know exactly how many such women have been vaccinated, but this is a quote from um, uh, uh, Anthony Fauci in the US, 
uh, just recently just saying that approximately 20,000 pregnant women have been vaccinated uh, as part of the US program uh, with no red flags, no, no concerns identified. So uh, I think it's true to say that there is insufficient evidence to recommend routine use of COVID-19 vaccines during pregnancy at this moment in time, but vaccination in pregnancy should still be considered where the risk of exposure to infection is high and cannot be avoided, and where the woman has underlying conditions that put them at high risk of serious complications, and that clinicians should discuss the risks and benefits of vaccination with the pregnant woman who should be told about the absence of safety data for the vaccine in pregnancy, um, but her individual risks associated with COVID-19. Now, risk factors for serious COVID-19, Shakila's just shared those with us and, um, uh, and she has a much more definitive list of what risk factors uh, appear to, to pose um, a greater risk of complications in pregnant women. Uh, th this is taken from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists uh, in the UK website. Uh, and I, I think it just starts to show us that there are um, a, a number of specific risk factors that should be part of a discussion with such um, uh, pregnant women in thinking about the potential benefit for them of vaccination. So a range of underlying medical conditions, uh, obesity, uh, higher age, uh, and so on. Risk factors include, of course, those who are social and healthcare workers, uh, but also potentially where there is a lot of COVID-19 in their direct community um, and a crowded household and being of black, Asian or minority ethnicity background. And Shakila, I think, has shown that in her uh, systematic review. Uh, breastfeeding seems more straightforward because there is no known risks associated with giving non-live vaccines whilst breastfeeding. And so breastfeeding women may be offered vaccination with COVID-19 with the normal discussion uh, around what we do and what we don't know with regard to breastfeeding. Uh, I referred to the RCOG website uh, and I think uh, it's a, a nice summary of the issues. This is a um, uh, for, for, for pregnant women to look at, and I think it, it gives a balanced views of the pros and cons. So refer you to that website for further information. So let me finish by saying that pregnant women should be provided with a balanced and clear assessment of their risk of COVID-19, taking into account their own individual circumstances and risk factors, local practices and available evidence. And they should be counseled with a balanced summary of the potential direct and indirect benefits of COVID-19 vaccines, whilst acknowledging the current lack of safety data. And that vaccination should not be withheld from pregnant women who have received adequate counseling. Uh, clearly, it's uh, of high importance that surveillance uh, on uh, vaccination in pregnancy is done and done well, both in country and globally. And I think it is also a priority that very specific studies of vaccination in pregnant women uh, are now done. And these are being started and, and we and others are also doing others and uh, other studies. And, and this is really important so that we can enhance very rapidly the evidence base that we can then use to discuss with pregnant women uh, and their partners and the healthcare workers that look after them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for the comprehensive overview about vaccines uh, in general, as well as specific to pregnancy. We have already have got numerous questions that were submitted before the webinar and uh, being submitted now. We'll address those during the panel discussion. Uh, I would now like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Gloria Rowland, who is a midwife by profession, and it's my pleasure to have uh, worked with her while she was a director of midwifery at Bart's Health NHS Trust. Uh, Gloria is now the chief nurse of Southwest Integrated Care System, which brings together NHS council as well as voluntary sectors. And she's also the chief nurse for Southwest London NHS Commissioning Group. And Gloria is um, uh, going to give a talk on um, vaccine uptake and role of healthcare professionals. Gloria? Yes, can you put on my camera? I think somebody has yep. the camera. Yeah, could you start your video now? It should be yes. asking you to, yeah. yeah. Okay, let me share your slides. Thank um... you. Okay. 
Thank you, Shekina. I just want to say very good morning or good afternoon, or good evening to everybody worldwide. And I'm going to be talking about COVID vaccination and the role of, of, of the professionals. Let's move to the next slide, please. So um, the data that we have, I, I want to probably stay in the UK with most of my, my, my slides. We, we are aware that over 120 people have actually died of COVID in the UK. And majority of these people are from the Black and Asian ethnic minority groups. Um, definitely we know it's a global problem, so it doesn't really matter race, but in terms of proportionately, it's mostly the Black and Asian community that are most affected in the UK. Now, if you then look at, in terms of how many people have been vaccinated in the UK, we've got over 20 million people have been, have been vaccinated, and that takes us to about 45%, 45% of our population of over 16 years of age. But similar data, if you then look at it in terms of looking at how many people have been given the vaccine in terms of ethnicity, you can see that it's about 71% of the white population has been given. And then if you look at South Asian, about 58%, and the Black communities, you can see it's about 38% in terms of healthcare workers. Let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of ethical principle, I'm not going to dwell on this that much because we know it. In terms of autonomy, everybody has the capacity to actually make their own choice based on their moral values and in terms of several. And in, when then look at other ethical principle in terms of um, utilitarianism, it's about that actually being able to take the right action or do the right thing, but thinking about the greatest number of people that it will affect. So based on this principle, let's go to the next slide, please. So based on these principles, I would then say, why do we have to take the vaccine? Really, we know that uh, the, the pandemic has really affected us that much. And mostly, like I said, within the ethnic minority groups. And also it has wrecked the economic, social economics um, status of the whole world, not just in one country. And definitely people that have pre existing medical condition suffer the most. And mainly there are other factors that plays into this in terms of health inequalities and marginalization. Let's move to the next thing. So importance of vaccine, we know the importance and I'm not gonna preach this enough. And like I said, we, I'm not here to judge people in terms of what they do or how they manage themselves in terms of ethical, and moral principles. But definitely, um, Paul has done a good job and Shikela in terms of giving us the background and giving us the information that we needed to understand why we need, really need to take the vaccine and mainly to protect ourselves and others. Let's move to the next slide, please. So I, I took this slide from, from an, an American site and it actually is a beautiful slide that actually showed where people were. And you can see majority of people are actually within that middle bit, which is about passive acceptance to the other side where actually people are accepted. And then you have at the extreme end, not too many people that actually are basically refuser. And with good information, with discussion, you can see that people then move from being passive, accept, um, from passive acceptance into an active acceptance um, uh, phase. So again, people can change their mind. And sometimes people just need that sort of like reassurance. Let's move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I'm gonna sum up some of the challenges that we are facing. Definitely there are three, three group of people. We have the people that are anti-vaxxers that they don't really want vaccine. And it doesn't have, it's not just about COVID vaccine, it's any vaccine really. Then you then will have people that, whether you believe it or not, that doesn't really believe that COVID-19 existed, despite all what is going on in the media. Then the community, the third one are people that actually have sort of like reluctancy to it, which they call COVID-19 um, COVID vaccine hesitance group. And really, this is really genuine concern that people are really afraid. Let's move to the next one, please. So when I look at most of the evidence that how there, and I also put a sort of like a survey out this week to find out why are people, why are people not actually partaking in the, in the vaccination? Why don't they want to take it? Majority of the things I've, I've came across sort of like bought to us trust. And that trust, I'll probably talk a bit about that as I, as I move on in this slide. So there's that 
one of some of the reasons why people don't really know is about that was some of the things that Paul have already touched on in terms of how quick the vaccine was sort of like made and in terms of the safety of the vaccine. That trust is the big one, misinformation. And we know our community like WhatsApp. And there's a lot of things going on on the WhatsApp group in terms of information and misconception about the vaccine. And there's been a lot of so stories in the past about the ethnic, um, ethnic, uh, ethnic, ethnic reason in terms of ethical reason in terms of mistrust of the government and things that have happened in the past. And there's something about that fear of is that whether the vaccine is going to change our DNA. Again, a lot of that has been covered by Paul. And there's also that religious aspect of it, which again, there's no proof or evidence for that. Let's move to the next thing, please. And really, uh, again, this is just all that sort of like sum summary in terms of why people don't want it. People talk about underrepresentation of minority in the research of uh, vaccine trial. But actually, there are few, there are few um, people from black and ethnic minority group in the trials. And also there are issues around inter inter intersectionalities, which is not just about the COVID itself. We have deprivation, socioeconomic reason, the other reason that can actually cause that, including access to the vaccine itself. Let's move to the next slide, please. So generally I've summed it up in terms of why the, why the black and Asian minority ethnic group are actually very hesitant to the vaccine. One is about personal racism. We know that there's issue around institutional racism and being treated differently. We know that there's underrepresentation in terms of clinical trials. However, no matter how small the, um, the representations are, people also, uh, black and ethnic minority actually took part in the COVID-19 vaccine trials. Then in terms of some of the historical history, back to the slavery, and these are things that are really deep, deeply seated. And there was a study carried out in the US in terms of civil studies in which black people are used as guinea pig and they were not aware that they are being used. And the one of the most re recent really ECOF is the one that they did in Nigeria whereby Nigeria children are tested on drugs without actually taking permission from the parents. So again, these things are out there and that might actually contribute to why people are very hesitant in terms of, hesitant in terms of taking the vaccine. Let's move to the next slide, please. So I just want to give you some how you can actually change the narrative in terms of this. The first thing is for you to take the vaccine yourself and to take that, you can actually change your mind based on sound evidence. And like I said, Paul Shakila has already sort of like given us the really strong sound evidence behind it. Once you take it and you are protecting yourself and you are protecting your colleagues. In terms of the trial, I've given some figures here in terms of the people that are involved in the trial. So there were ethnic minority people involved in the trials um, throughout, depending on the vaccine. And also in terms of clarity, we have to give this simple message to people, evidence-based message, and actually try to really reduce the number of misconceptions that are going out there. And also, I just want to make sure that we have frank discussion about actually um, in terms of all the ingredients that is around the COVID development. And again, in terms of what, whether it's going to alter our DNA, we know that that is not true. And again, it's about really having that sound evidence to be able to sort of like give people reassurance. And people honestly have genuine fear about it. And so there is that difference between people that doesn't want the vaccine and the people that actually have the, the um, genuine concern about the vaccine. So I, I think for me, in terms of summary, that is where I really want to leave it in terms of why is it that people don't want to get the vaccine and some of the tips that we have in terms of um, how you can change people's mind or you, you thinking about how you can actually decide yourself by going to look at this evidence behind the vaccine rather than actually listen to misinformation or misconception that are traveling around globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria, for highlighting um, uh, the health inequalities as well as the concerns uh, from uh, ethnic minority groups on vaccine uptake and, and how we need to address it. And uh, now I would like to uh, invite our last speaker of the day. It's my pleasure to invite um, Dr. Rehan Khan. Um, Rehan was my uh, colleague 
who is, a, who is currently a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at Bath Health NHS Trust. And he's also the Dean for Education and a trustee of LE Charity. Um, the uh, screen is yours, Rehan. Shall I share your presentation? Yes, please. Uh, uh, greetings, everybody. Um, and uh, someone can put my... Yes. Uh, my video on as well. Yeah, great. Yeah, if you can share the slides, that'll be good. Sorry, struggling to share that. Yes, one sec. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I hope that you're all well. So we, we, this is an extension to think about you as a global audience now. So I'm really grateful to Gloria for picking up a really very clear and accurate picture of what is going on in the UK. Next slide, please. So this is a picture. This is my friend, Martin. Martin is a trauma surgeon at the Royal London Hospital. The Royal London is a trauma center. Martin spends his days helping people with gunshot wounds and people who've been stabbed. But now Martin spends his days talking to hospital porters and people he meets in the street about coronavirus and about the vaccine. He then goes and works in the vaccine centre himself. This emphasises the extent to which this is now everybody's problem and everybody's solution. So I want to explain why he's doing this. Next slide, please. The UK's position is not the same as the rest of the world. The vaccine rollout, I think it's fair to say, has, apart from Israel, gone out pretty much faster here than everywhere else. But as glory, oh, has it gone back to the start, Shakila? I've gone back on slide one. No, that, very good, thank you. Um, but as Gloria has pointed out, there are discrepancies in who is receiving and or accepting the vaccine, which you can see on the larger picture here. What The message I want to get across in the first part of this very short talk is what we are observing here is A, predictable, and B, will play out, but in subtly different ways in whichever community or country that you're in. Next slide, please. There is a correlation, I think, that we're about to demonstrate. So what I think the correlation is, is a correlation between the people who are most vulnerable of becoming very unwell or dying from COVID-19 and those who are least likely to accept the vaccine. Now, this may seem contradictory, but actually there might be very deep-seated ideas around health inequalities which might play into this. So you saw on the previous slide who's accepting the vaccine, and on this slide, you can see who's dying from COVID-19, which is essentially uh, poor people, and ethnic minority people in the UK. Next slide, please. And now we can apply this to pregnancy, okay? So Shakila's Living Systematic Review has confirmed that pregnancy is important with regards to COVID-19 infection, and it is disproportionately probably important for different groups. So if uh, we use the example that Gloria gave with regards to women from ethnic minorities, that might be one, but we can also play in social deprivation. So it's almost like a perfect storm. The people who you want to protect the most might be the people who historically had the biggest health inequalities and might be the least likely to accept the vaccine or the most nervous about it. Next slide, please. And this is um, not new. Data from Tanzania here shows that if you look at vaccination in pregnancy in general, if you use the fact that you're in a rural population as a surrogate for being nervous about health or not having access to good health care, you can actually see the vaccine hesitancy is more persistent and more profound in that group. And in general, interestingly, if you look from UK data from ONS, you see that young women are a particularly hesitant group. Now, I, I'm a middle-aged mum. I'm not going to fall pregnant. It's a young woman who's most likely to fall pregnant. They're in the exact group who, even if we weren't talking about a COVID-19 vaccine, would feel the most nervous. And I think we need to think about that now. We need to think about it now before we end up in a place where we're looking at a full rollout of vaccine in a pregnant population. Next, the next slide, please. And there has been some attention to this already. And you can get a flavor from the picture on the right. 
that you do get variation already in people's opinion about COVID-19 vaccine acceptance in different countries. What the, what the detail on the left suggests very much backs up Gloria's points about the role of the health professional. Gloria put up a slide which used the word trust in big letters. Who do people trust when they're pregnant? What I hope the answer to that is, is they trust their midwife, they trust their obstetrician, they trust their primary care practitioner. If we are to maintain that trust, we are going to need to know how to have the conversation. Because at the moment, it's hard for us. It's as confusing for the obstetric and maternity community as everybody else. Next slide, please. All of us are bombarded with news stories. Sometimes they're consistent, often they're contradictory. <clears throat> and moreover, as time has gone on, the narrative about this uh, vac one slide, thank you, about this vaccine in pregnancy has changed. Many of us remember that when the Pfizer came out, the initial instruction was not recommended for breastfeeding women and pregnant women. It then switched to user benefit and risk discussion. And this is the equipoise I think that we're all in. To try and help all of us through this, the final slides of these talk show you exactly where to go at the moment. This is at least what I would recommend for anyone practicing in the UK. But having done several literature searches, I think because the UK vaccination program is a bit ahead, uh, this kind of advice is perhaps slightly ahead at the moment. So I'm indebted to Lucy Chappell's group, the RCOG. Next slide, please. To show you the decision tree from the RCOG. So this is continuously being updated and it is an attempt to try and help professionals and women themselves come to an informed and individualized decision about whether or not they should have the vaccine. It is a live document. I have to accept that the information does change, but it is a really useful resource, which I've been using with uh, my colleagues and with the women I have the privilege to look after. Next slide, please. And I am not going to go through this in detail. I think what instead I will do is I will share the link on chat because this is actually work for all of us afterwards, which is to go through this. Many of the things coming through on Q&A are actually answered by this document. The problem is, I think perhaps not everybody knows of the existence of the document, but certainly in the UK, we have come to a single opinion about how to try and, next slide, how to try and answer these questions. Um, and so uh, I think, Shakila, I think actually that's all I wanted to say today. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat and then I think we can proceed with questions and answers. Thank you very much, Rehan, for uh, the clear presentation and it really will be helpful. Thanks for sharing that as well. Um, so now let's move to the panel discussion. Uh, may I invite all on the state since regards um, and the concerns about is there a particular period of ovulation in which I should take vaccine or not whether it, and concerns while in the periconception period someone had the vaccine the first trimester and our concerns about taking the second dose of the vaccine um, someone is between pregnancies and had the uh, vaccine uh, the first dose in between pregnancies and now uh, become pregnant the second time um, and same as um, if you have a cesarean section can I have the vaccine immediately after cesarean section or should I wait so there's a lot of questions on the timing of vaccine and safety uh, and would like to welcome your views on that may I come in Shakila sure yeah these are firstly <clears throat> Not only are these excellent questions, they, these are the exact questions all of us are being asked every day. So rather than me pretending I instantly know the answer, I'll tell you what my approach always is, which is um, on, my, on my screening clinic, I open the decision tree, which I have posted the link for, and I literally go through all of it with each woman who's asked the question. 
So it's in order to answer the specific question, but it's also in order to be able to have a comprehensive conversation. So there are some very broad truths, which I, I, I'd be very happy to share. May I start with fertility? Um, there is no demonstrable link that anybody can think of biologically between a fertility issue and this vaccination. So that, in some ways, that's the clearest answer I can give. Now, of course, inevitably, <clears throat> women and fellow health professionals ask me, and I ask myself in bed, have I just described proof? I'm not sure I'm describing proof. I think what I'm describing is pragmatism. We have to understand from Shakila's and others' work that COVID-19 may be more dangerous in pregnancy. We have to accept that the COVID-19 vaccines have as yet not been tested specifically in pregnant women. But nonetheless, that is a balance. We have to accept that there is balance and equipoise in any of these conversations. And as Gloria correctly pointed out, an individual has the right to take their own decision. But unless you have the conversation, you won't actually know what's on someone's mind. And it might be quite easy to disabuse somebody of really things which are completely fake, whereas there might be things which are very realistic and it might well be, and this has been my experience, that a woman has entirely under understood the equipoise of that balance between an absence of evidence versus no biological reason why something should be a problem. So it is genuinely tricky, but we cannot escape that if COVID-19 infection becomes severe in pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, and uh, it might render someone very unwell or dead, that we have got to have the conversation. So the answer actually is I use the decision tree. And what the decision tree suggests is there's no particular reason to be concerned with regards to fertility or breastfeeding or which trimester of pregnancy you're in or necessarily if you've just had surgery. Oh my God, I've just seen there's an MP on the chat. Right, uh, Stella, you... Um, Welcome, and uh, I think Shakila's going to make you wait your turn for your question. <laughs> let's, see, <laughs> let's see who's next. <laughs> also, Stella, you're my MP. I live in I live in um, Walthamstow. I shall try to get to your question, Stella. But in the meantime, Paul uh, concerns uh, questions about mRNA vaccine and safety uh, about Pfizer, particularly. Could you help answer that? Uh, so I, um, I haven't seen the specific question, Shakila, but um, <clears throat> I think I think you know to, to start with. Obviously, we have to uh, recognise, as I as I mentioned, that the RNA vaccine technology is new to us all. Uh, though there has been some um, use of uh, RNA vaccines in the cancer setting, there's very little, and, and clearly there's not been a licensed vaccine um, before. In fact, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and so we have relatively little knowledge about what mRNA vaccines uh, do. Uh, and, and in particular, we have uh, no knowledge in pregnancy. Uh, but having said that, uh, we have also no reason to, to believe that there will be anything specific about pregnancy and these vaccines. And I, and I, I think I did see some questions about, well, what about... Um, the RNA uh, crossing the placenta into the fetal circulation. Indeed, what about the spike protein uh, in those other vaccines which, uh, in which spike protein uh, is administered, like the Novavax, which is a spike protein adjuvant vaccine? What about the spike protein passing the placenta into the fetal uh, circulation, so the impact on the fetus? And of course, we don't know, but there is no specific we don't, first of all, know whether they do pass the placenta. There's a, there's a, there's a chance that they do. E even if they did, I, I can't actually see why that would be a specific concern. We're not talking about a live virus passing the placenta into the fetal circulation and causing fetal infection. Um, I suppose at, 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 at best or at worst, depending on how you view it, there may be, it may induce an immune response in the fetus against um, the virus. Uh, which I could only see probably as a good thing. Um, so the, the, the fetal uh, immune cells responding to the presence of the spike protein uh, and um, generating an immune response, which of course will, will largely be dictated by the, the, the gestation uh, uh, at which 
uh, that occurs. So we need to learn more about the mRNA vaccines in pregnancy and indeed all of these vaccines in pregnancy. And with time, we will. I alluded to the specific studies that are being done. They will report, I suspect, later this year. Um, but there is no biologically plausible reason why we should have specific concerns about these vaccines when given to pregnant women. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and the, the question which uh, Stella and many uh, others have asked us is, should pregnant women now be prioritized as a group? Um, and I think we need to look at it from two perspectives. One is uh, to accept and acknowledge that pregnancy per se should be considered as a risk factor. And this is particularly important mm -hmm. in terms of risk assessment. So when I uh, do my antenatal clinics, there are, I see a lot of pregnant women who say they are in their first trimester. However, they are not considered to be too much of a high risk because they are early on in pregnancy. And I think we will need to move away from it. You're not at risk just because you're early in your pregnancy. Pregnancy per se is a risk factor and need to be taken into account um, in risk assessments at work and in all conversations, particularly if they have additional risk factors, if they are from, a, from an ethnic minority background, if they're of old age and obesity, uh, uh, all of these will need to be taken into account as you would do with the general population. And question is, um, should now vaccines be given to pregnant women um, as a group on their own? Uh, so at the moment in UK, we are still having a risk factor based priority. So if you have an underlying risk factor and you happen to be pregnant, yes, uh, you are eligible. Or if your exposure because of your profession, in this case, healthcare professionals, and you happen to be pregnant, you are. Uh, there are certain organizations like FIGO has put on a statement saying that we should offer the vaccine to all pregnant women. And I think this is something um, JCBI in uh, UK and other um, such boards in other countries will need to look at the uh, evidence that we have on the increased severity of vaccines in pregnancy and, with, and compare it with um, the data, I think the USCDC in the last webinar, they gave data on 30,000 pregnant women who now receive the vaccine, 15,000 with Pfizer and 15,000 in Moderna. And we have not uh, seen any adverse effects. They have pregnancy outcomes in around 1,000 of those women across the trimesters and again, no adverse outcomes. So I think uh, we will need to start looking pragmatically at the real life data. Unfortunately, the, any trial data is going to take a while to come. And I don't think we should deny pregnant women the vaccine uh, while waiting, but instead focus on uh, the data that's available in the real world setting uh, in the meantime. Uh, and Ram would, uh, would like to have yours and Joe's thoughts um, on pregnant women being considered as a high risk group. I, I think the risk benefit system that we're doing at the moment is a very pragmatic and, you know, good way forward, you know, in the absence of big studies. The only issue with regards to, you know, the about the cerebral sinus thrombosis and the coagulation state is we probably will have to um, assess the risk of hypercoagulability in some of our patients who are known to be at increased risk of thrombosis already. So maybe, you know, I... I expect that, you know, with some caution will be advised, say, you know, in the periods of pregnancy where, you know, the risk of hypercoagulation is higher, you know, which is, say, towards the end of the third trimester or, you know, in the first few weeks in the postnatal period. Again, you know, so I think we need to, you know, see what the data is coming out. But, you know, obviously the, the, these risks you know, are seem to be confined to younger women. And you know, so therefore that will include pregnant women. So, you know, let's wait and see. I, I suspect, you know, something will be put in there when you, you know, do a case by case risk assessment, which will include women who, you know, are at a recognized risk of increased coagulability. Thank you. Adam? 
Um, yes. So from my aspect, I, I mean, the, the practical steps are already there in place. I mean, even I had patients from the Chelsea and Westminster Trust uh, during the week who are already being offered the uh, vaccine in the first trimester of their pregnancy, and they're going through a sort of a risk um, assessment, as what Rehan says. Um, and um, from the uh, and they've got medical input there regarding any sort of high risk states uh, in terms of background medical conditions. So it's already being rolled out by trust as we speak. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Paul, there is a question on yellow card incidents in pregnancy. Um, Um, I'm not sure what the question is, Shakila. I mean, obviously, the yellow card in the UK is the way we have of um, uh, assessing uh, vaccine safety. Um, I'm not aware, uh, and indeed, th that is you know published on a weekly basis. I think from the MHRA, so um, uh, which is which is great. I'm not I'm not aware of anything specifically related to pregnancy associated with yellow card reports. Nothing has um, uh, stood out as being specific to pregnancy uh, to this time. Yeah, and I'm also not aware of anything globally as well as any major complication in pregnant women following vaccine um, to date uh, from what's reported. But and obviously, this is still very early. And this is something that we as a group are looking in as part of our systematic review on adverse outcomes in women exposed to um, the vaccine. But so far, um, it has been a reassuring um, data that we are looking at. Uh, and, and, and Gloria, um, uh, what is the advice that you would um, suggest or recommendation to midwives and uh, other healthcare professionals who are caring for uh, women with regards to um, allaying some of the misconceptions or concerns? Um, Yes, thank you, Shekina. I just want to say one, and I've seen in some, one of the questions, there was a question from a midwife about using PGD. Um, when we are going to, if, when, if the vaccine becomes like everyone, every pregnant woman gets that. And I'm sure they will definitely move it from PSA at the minute into PGD at that point. But at the minute, because it's a risk-based um, service and there are, there are only few women if you relate that to the proportion of pregnant women, and I think it still have to be on that on that PSA in terms of um, it's being um, prescribed. So just to answer that midwife that asked that question, then in terms of general comment to everybody, it's not just midwife. But I think to everyone, will be you've had the evidence today. There are tons of evidence out there. I would say you try and get your own vaccine first because um, it's going to be hard for you to then advise somebody to go and take the vaccine when you've not had yours. So please do get your vaccine first and then you look at all the sound evidence out there to be able to sort of like talk to your women and their families. And women, I'll say to you now, there's so much going on WhatsApp group and there's so much going on in terms of um, also what's what COVID can do and what, how, what are the remedies for COVID. But again, these are misconceptions that have not been proven. So again, it's about actually having that intelligence to be able to answer people's questions when they ask you those questions. And finally, I just want to say that in terms of um, some of the things that are going on in terms of ginger, and I'm, I'm going to be saying it because I'm in Nigeria myself, and I know I've got a lot of WhatsApp messages about how to mix concussion, ginger, lemon, and so on and so forth. Some of these are sort of like they don't have those control. Again, it's about us thinking about this and making sure we are applying the right evidence for that. I, I've, I've taken my first dose of my vaccine. It took me ages to convince my mom because I know when I first told her, she told me, go get yours first. And I have to actually tell her, when it's my turn, I'll get mine. But I've gotten mine now. So please do advise your family, advise your friend, and use evidence-based information to actually advise your patients as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gloria. Uh, and uh, firstly, thanks to all the panelists and the speakers. And we, we, there are so many questions and we have, and I am sorry that we have not been able to answer individually. We've tried um, in the hour for the webinar to answer as much as we can. Uh, we will try in the coming um, days, uh, if possible, to answer some more. 
uh, please um, come to our website. We will provide uh, updated evidence as it emerges in the PRECO website. Uh, and this webinar will be available, uh, it's recorded and will be available for you to view at our PRECO website. Uh, Caroline will be on YouTube, isn't it? That's right, yes. We'll make sure that the link gets sent out to everybody who's registered, so we'll email that to you. Okay, uh, thank you uh, everyone and thanks to all the participants uh, for joining us. Stay safe and we will be in touch in the future.